Okay, hello everyone. Um, I don't know. I don't know what's going on with what's showing on the screen because, like, in my view, uh, this is the screen is like zoomed in, but it's. I, I mean, I'm looking at the camera feedback, and like, this is something that is only showing up on YouTube. And yes, it's Symphony of the Night. Uh, it's Crystal Catacombs. Uh, theme. So that's good. Good. Uh, good ear. I don't understand what's. Uh, I don't know why in my YouTube feedback I'm or like in the YouTube playback that I'm watching um, it looks like it's zoomed in on the upper left hand corner of the screen, but um, uh, it's definitely not what my camera is doing. So I'm not really sure um, what's going on there. I didn't change anything about the cameras. It looks fine. So here's here's the question. Can you see the pin? Because <laughs> for whatever reason, I can't see the pin. So let me know. If you can see the pin, I will continue. But it's weird because I can't actually see. Uh, in the YouTube feedback, I can't actually see what's... Oh, okay. Crazy. It must be just be my... Um, it just, must just be my the YouTube part of this. Oh, that's weird. Yeah, that's so weird. I don't, I don't know. My... Um, the, like in YouTube playback is is messed up so okay so I'll just up oh, that's good good all right so uh, I will then pretend like uh, like the the screen that I'm looking at that shows the you know the accurate uh, depiction is you know what what you all are seeing because that that happens to be the case um sorry about Monday uh, this my laptop that I stream on is kind of on its last legs I've had it for almost five years now so uh, I'm gonna get gonna get another one soon, but uh, it's it's okay for today. But yeah, it's it's not it's not doing too well. So um, so I was having some issues with it on Monday. Anyway, though, um, uh, everything you know in, in the in the future, typically what will happen is um, if there's any technical issues either with the internet, you know, last semester I had a couple of classes I had to uh, postpone and move or cancel due to internet issues. Um, during the live stream. So if something like that happens, um, typically what I'll do is, uh, depending on how much material we've covered and how much I want to cover, I'll either, you know, cancel the lecture and not post anything, or I'll record it at some other time and post it and let you all know. So it's not, um, not a, not a big deal. I'll let you all know one way or the other, but the point is, um, you know, I will try to minimize inconvenience since, you know, I, the, the plan is to do all this, um, live so anyway um so we had just finished discussing um scales of notation that is number bases so what i wanted to do now is uh following the textbook here there's a little bit of a it's not really a it's not really a detour um but it leads us into a discussion that is a little bit of a detour but unfortunately it's just kind of impossible to avoid so um i want to discuss prime numbers Okay, now I may have mentioned this uh, previously, that uh, there's a number of uh, places where prime numbers kind of naturally come up. So here's an example of where the Egyptians may have noticed um, prime numbers cropping up. So remember that the Egyptians had this weird quirk in their mathematics where they absolutely insisted on writing a fraction like this as a sum of a bunch of unit fractions with different denominators. So four-fifths may have been write, written like one-half plus uh, one-fourth plus one-twentieth, right? Okay, so this may have been, this is just an example of how the Egyptians may um, have written something like this. Now, um, once I say have four-fifths expressed like this, then if I consider fractions that um, are multiples of the denominator, all right, so say four tenths. Well, how can I how can I write four tenths now as a sum of unit fractions of different denominators? Well, if I began with that way of of writing a fraction, then all I can do since ten is a multiple of five, it's just two times five. I can Likewise, just multiply each of these denominators by two and end up with another decomposition that, that satisfies these rules that I'm 
putting on myself. So here, this would be one fourth plus one eighth plus one fortieth, right? Okay. Uh, and of course, another multiple of five is fifteen. So four fifteenth similarly would have followed this rule. Notice that we're not changing the numerator here, and that's because we're not messing with the fact that these are unit fractions. So we're just doing the easiest possible thing here. And so 15 is 3 times 5. And so using this decomposition again, I would get 1 over 3 times 2 is 6, plus 1 over 3 times 4 is 12, plus 1 over 60. Right? And, you know, you, you take for granted um, how nice this is knowing that you have a decomposition for four fifths. If I ask you to do this for four fifteenths, right, and I hid this from you, right, so I didn't tell you that uh, this was the decomposition for four fifths, coming up with this decomposition can be kind of tricky, right? You can just try it yourself. It's, it's, um, it can be a little annoying to come up with these decompositions, okay? So again, as I said, um, for some reason, my YouTube is, um, showing like a tiny fraction of the screen. So if there's anything that you can't see, let me know in the chat. Um, because I'm, I'm basically going blind here. So I'm, uh, I'm assuming that this all looks, looks good and you can see all this. So anyway, um, okay. So, um, what do you notice then, right? So, uh, working backwards for a second, what did we need in order to write this easily? It was nice to have really what we're looking for here is a prime factorization of 15. Or we're looking for when we have a denominator that can't be factored anymore, right? That has no divisors, right? So note, um, if... We want to write a fraction A over B. That's not a 9, that's an A. So if we want to write a fraction A over B as a sum of unit fractions, it is sufficient to consider the case when B has no, they're called proper divisors. So B has no proper divisors. Okay. Okay. Well, we know another way of saying that is that B is prime. All right, so the denominator is prime. Okay, so the only divisors it has are one in itself. Okay, and so, um, of course, the reason that it's sufficient to consider this is because it turns out that any number can be written as a product of prime numbers, and so if you know how to write A over B, where B is prime, um, as a sum of unit fractions, then basically you can do, you can write any of these as, as a sum of unit fractions. Okay, that's the idea. Okay. Um, and so uh, it's possible that the Egyptians noted this because the Egyptians clearly, when they were working out some of these uh, decompositions of, of these fractions into a sum of unit fractions, um, uh, it's clear that they used some of these, you know, the fact that, for instance, say 15 is a multiple of 5 to, to be able to more easily uh, write these things. Okay. Um, and so... Uh, Quick definition. So uh, a whole number, uh, really a positive whole number, uh, say p greater than one is prime uh, if it's only divisors are one and P. Okay, now um, a couple of things to note here. Um, when we say divisors, what do we mean? So um, when you say that a number, when we say that a number divides another number, we have a very specific uh, 
uh, meaning here. So let's do another little side definition here. So we say A divides B if um, A, or we should say B, is equal to A times K for some integer K. Okay, so this is what we say, and what we write in symbols is A bar B. So this is A divides B. We're not going to use this too much, but this is to just to familiarize yourself with this, uh, because there's later we'll I'll get more into this stuff, and I may repeat this symbol, and I don't want you to be confused when I write this. So this is what it means for A to divide B. So K is some uh, integer. So um, you can note some particular examples. So note, uh, for instance, um, 2 divides 6. Right? Why does 2 divide 6? Because 6 can be written as 2 times 3. Right? So in this case, that sum integer is 3. Okay. Uh, another example is, say, um, you know, 7 divides 21. Again, I'm actually going to use the same thing. Hold on for a second. Okay, I don't know. The neighbors are making a ruckus. It was really, really loud, so I couldn't... Uh, <laughs> I had no idea what was going on. Anyway, um, so... Uh, 21 is 7 times 3. Now, of course, I use 3 uh, again here, but it doesn't have to be the case. Uh, in fact, um, you know, one example is, uh, uh, for instance, uh, we could say um, uh, 1 divides 17, right? Since 17 is... Uh, 1 times 17. So in this case, our sum integer is 17. Okay. Um, of course, examples of numbers not dividing other numbers. Uh, so 5 does not divide 17. Why? Well, 17 is not equal to 5 times k for any integer k. Okay, so this is just making rigorous the thing that you've known since grade school that is, you know, this is the notion of proper divisors for, for integers, right? Okay, and so a whole number's prime, uh, if its only divisors are, are 1 and p, or 1 in itself, so p is prime if its only divisors are 1 and p. Now, you might have noticed that I insist that when we're talking about a prime number, it's bigger than 1, so smallest prime number is 2. Okay. Uh, why is 1 not prime? Um, this is just a convention. You could come up with a definition of prime that includes 1. Um, purely the only reason why we don't let 1 be a prime number is just for um, ease of language because there's a fact about prime numbers that we're going to talk about here in a little bit called um, unique factorization. And if 1 is a prime number, then the factorization is not unique. So basically what unique factorization says is that any number has a unique factorization as a product of primes, okay? Um, so any number you can think of is just a product of a bunch of primes. Now, not all those primes are distinct. So for instance, 4, right? 4 is 2 times 2. So the, the prime 2 shows up twice in 4's prime factorization. Um, so not all the primes are distinct in the list, but the idea is that any number you can dream of is just a product of a bunch of primes raised to some powers, okay? So for instance, um, think about like 20, right? So 20 is uh, 
4 times 5, you know, but of course, 5 is prime, but 4 isn't. 4 is 2 times 2. So 20 is 2 times 2 times 5, which is 2 squared times 5. Okay, and so um, it is a product of some number of primes. Not all the pr primes are distinct, but that factorization is unique. So the only thing that would change there is the order they show up in, right? So, so 20 is 2 times 5 times 2, or 5 times 2 times 2, or 5 times 2 squared. However, whatever order you want to write them in, is, it doesn't matter. Um, but the point is that it's always two copies of 2 and one copy of 5. If one was allowed to be prime, um, well, then we could just insert any number of ones anywhere we wanted to, and it would mean that that statement that we want to say would be bad. We wouldn't be able to say that it's unique because you could always shuffle any number of ones around. Okay. Slide down like this. Okay. So anyway, um, so this is the... Uh, uh, this is the reason why one is not prime. So anyway, this is what it means to be prime. Now, um, so then a way of restating what we just said about the Egyptians and how they might have noticed um, that numbers were prime um, uh, is that, or how they might have noticed prime numbers uh, in, in the math that they were doing, is that um, you begin with, um, you know, the problem of wanting to express uh, one of these fractions as a sum of unit fractions and you notice that oh well you know if I could if I knew this for the prime denominators right then this makes it very easy to come up with uh, further fraction decompositions uh, where I'm considering um, fractions whose whose denominators are multiples of those primes right just like we did in that example Okay, um, but another, we're kind of overlooking, uh, you know, kind of a really simple way that a lot of ancient civilizations, not just Egyptians, may have first noticed prime numbers, and that's um, the following, right? If I have, like, seven stones, right? So let's say that I have, like, seven stones, seven pebbles, okay? arranged like this well they don't have to be arranged like this say i've just tossed them down in a pile right and then i ask myself the question can i rearrange these in a way that rearranges them into a rectangle right and the answer is no right there's this extra one right and no matter how i rearrange these pebbles i can't rearrange them in such a way that they're a rectangle Okay, but if I had eight, right, the second that I have eight pebbles, right, can I rearrange these eight pebbles in a way that is a rectangle? Yeah, I could just move these two over here so that this is uh, the following rectangle. Now, what am I doing when I do this, right? right well, one of the ways that we teach kids multiplication in the first place is to think of it as counting objects, right? Two rows of four objects, right? So this would be two times four. Okay, so that's eight total objects. So two times four is eight. Another way of viewing this, of course, is to say that eight is factored as two times four. Okay. Now, of course, four could be factored further, but we'll forget about that for a second. The point is that eight uh, is factored as two times four. So eight is most certainly not prime. It has factors... Uh, other than 1 and 8, right? 2 and 4 are both factors. But 7 is prime because there's no way I can rearrange this group of pebbles, right, to make a rectangle. Okay, so I can never write this multiplication problem for 7, for instance, right? Or 17 or 19. Okay. And so uh, it's very likely that um, the Egyptians had noticed similar things like this. Um, the issue here is that um, when you were working with uh, a civilization that, so before the Greeks, right, and I keep returning to this, before the Greeks, um, these civilizations did not prove the things that they, they were using. They were purely focused on mechanical things, on, on um, you know, on applications. Okay, and as such, it, 
some of the conceptual stuff and what, how they viewed things gets lost because they were so focused on, uh, on these practical matters and there was no, um, no necessarily like complete, uh, account of, of these things. So it's actually unknown, uh, to what extent they viewed primes or knew of their properties or acknowledged them in any way. Um, now, you know, like I said, it's very likely, of course, that they at the very least notice that, oh, there are certain fractions that, you know, knowing the decomposition for that fraction means I automatically can generate a whole list of these for all of the fractions whose denominator is, is a multiple of one of these numbers. Okay. Okay. And so, um, uh, a little detour. Okay little detour that I think is worthy to go on. So a slight detour. So uh, the slight detour is going to take us through Greek mathematics. So um, the Greeks were the first to prove various facts. of mathematics okay um, and we will discuss uh, this at length later um, but you know the Greeks were the first to do this um, beginning in uh, so the very earliest Greek mathematics um, uh, so there was uh, for instance Thales um, that you know this textbook is named after I believe that was like 600 uh, BC roughly um, but for prime numbers specifically, uh, when some of this stuff was was kind of codified first, uh, even though it was it was known previously and it probably existed in some form, some of these proofs um, earlier than the fourth century uh, BC. But around 300 BC uh, is when these things found their way into Euclid's Elements. Okay, which we're going to discuss plenty. But I just wanted to. That's why this is a detour. I just wanted to give a quick uh, accounting of some of this stuff. And so the Greeks were the first to prove various facts. Um, and so uh, in particular, for prime numbers, uh, the following were directly proven in Euclid's elements. Okay, which is an absolutely amazing book. It's essentially the first true textbook. Um, and like I said, we'll be spending a ton of time talking about this. I have my own copy here that I will uh, open up and we'll have a look at. Um, and so um, uh, we have the following facts. So first of all, um, it's what's called Euclid's Lemma. So this is, uh, so first fact I wanted to mention, uh, this is book seven of the elements so this is book seven uh proposition 31 and yes one of the amazing things about the elements is that it is set up exactly like a modern textbook okay in fact almost all mathematical textbooks um even today are still modeled on euclid's elements so euclid's elements had postulates or axioms right these these assumptions and then everything else were lemmas, propositions, and theorems proven from that list of axioms that were added, you know, in a list. So, you know, um, basically things were built on and built on and built on just like uh, a modern day math textbook. That's exactly how, um, how this developed. So anyway, uh, book seven, proposition 31, this is called Euclid's Lemma. Um, this is the first step in uh, describing properties of the primes. So one was uh, every integer. So Euclid's lemma says every integer is divisible by some prime number. Uh, so this is every integer. I didn't actually finish saying this. Every integer uh, in greater than one. Okay, that's important because one is not necessarily divisible by a prime number because as we said, one's not prime. So, Okay, so every integer in greater than one is divisible by some prime number. 
Okay. So if an integer is bigger than one, it's divisible by some prime number. Okay. Uh, how did Euclid prove this? Uh, here's the following proof. Um, so um, let uh, so if n is greater than one, um, it has some divisors, right? That that are not one. It has some divisors that are greater than one. Uh, when I say some divisors, how many does it have? Well, it at least has itself, right? Any integer divides itself, right? So if I have an integer n greater than one, n is at least one factor or divisor of n. And so let um, let uh, let us uh, consider uh, a list of divisors of some integer n greater than one okay how long is this list well it the shortest it could possibly be is one divides it and it itself divides it right so um, in particular one divides n and n divides n, at the very least. Okay. So the shortest this list could possibly be is 2, right? It has 1 and n in it, right? Okay. Well, we have a list, right? Now, this is a, this is just some integer, bigger than 1. I have a list of divisors. How many divisors could an integer have? Well, it can't have infinitely many. It has to have a finite amount of divisors, right, at most. Right? I mean, if we are just being really crude here, right, if I consider the number like 15, how many divisors does 15 have? You could count yourself real quick, but does it have more than 15 divisors? No, that's clearly not possible. Right? So, hmm... How many divisors does this number have? Right. Well, the point is that it's some finite amount. Okay, so it's just some finite list. All right. So, uh, what do I say here? If it's, fin if it's a finite list, there has to be a smallest one. Of course, one you might say is all always the smallest, but let's consider the ones that are not one. There's at least one of those that's in. Right, so among these divisors, so among these divisors that are bigger than one, there must be a smallest one. There must be a smallest such divisor. Okay. Hmm. I'm going to leave that on the page here. Okay. So there's got to be a smallest such divisor. So call this divisor P. Note that P is prime. This would finish our proof. Right, because we were just trying to prove that every integer was divisible by some prime. And here we're saying that we found a divisor P. That divisor P has to be prime. But why? Well, P is the smallest divisor of N that is bigger than 1. Right? Can it have any other divisor? So let's see. Why? So why is P prime? Well... Here's a question. Can P have any divisors other than one? The answer is no. Why? Since P is the smallest divisor of n greater than 1, 
I, I'm not saying n is greater than one there. So since p is the smallest divisor of n that is greater than one, any other divisor of uh, so any other divisor of uh, p that is also greater than one would be a divisor of n that is greater than one, but would be smaller than p. But we said that p is the smallest such divisor. So we could not have a divisor of n that is smaller than p. And so what is the other divisor of p if not 1? Well, it's p. So then p has to be prime. So that's it. Okay. Now, this is exactly the proof that Euclid gave. Okay. To get you into the into the flavor of, of Greek proof writing. All right. Now this was immediately used, okay, in book nine to show the other factor. Of course, th it was stated a little bit different in, um, uh, in the elements, but uh, there's the following theorem that is, uh, again, stated a little bit different but this is from book nine of the elements so book nine uh, proposition 20 there are infinitely many prime numbers Yeah, someone's asking for me to bring the last page back for a second. So here's the last page with the proof. With the, the top part that was on another page. <clears throat> okay. So the idea is we want to look at a list of divisors of N. Uh, and we want to look at... Uh, a list of divisors, specifically the divisors that are bigger than 1. We know that 1 divides any number, so we, we toss that out. So we're looking at the list of divisors of n that are bigger than 1. We know that this is a list. It's not empty. There's something to talk about here because at least n divides n. Okay? And so we have a list of divisors of n that are all bigger than 1. Okay? Among that list, there's got to be a smallest one. Okay? This notion is a little tricky whenever you're talking about an infinite list of things. Okay, so when you're talking about an infinite list of things, talking about a smallest such element, that that gets a little trickier. That's something we'll talk about later. But we have a finite list, so it's never a problem to pick out a smallest member of that list. Okay, so there's a smallest such divisor of n that is bigger than 1. Okay, so call that divisor p. Well, that p has to be prime, and that's, that's the prime divisor of n that we were looking for. Now, why is that p prime? Um, well, if... What would have to go wrong for it to not be prime? It would have to have some divisor, right, that's a proper divisor that is bigger than 1, okay, um, other than p and 1, right? Uh, but the problem is that p is the smallest divisor of n that's bigger than 1. Any other divisor of p that is also bigger than 1 would be a, a divisor of n. So if p is a divisor of n, any divisor of a divisor of a number has to be a, the, a divisor of the larger number. This is a, an intermediate fact that I didn't prove, but, um, but I could show in, in like one line just from the definition of divisor. Okay. Uh, and since p is the smallest such divisor, we can't have a divisor of p that's also bigger than 1. Okay. Other than p itself. So p is prime. Okay. All right, so that's why uh, every integer is divisible by at least some prime number. Okay, and uh, this theorem says that there are infinitely many prime numbers. Okay, 
And so, um, how can I prove this? This is a very important fact. Now, you might look at a thing like this, and if you haven't seen a proof of a fact like this before, it is easy for you to maybe look at this and say, well, of course, there's got to be infinitely many prime numbers because there's infinitely many numbers. So, you know, you come up with some rule to define a subset of those numbers. You feel like, you know, if you're not too restrictive, it's got to it's got to also be infinite. But that's not the case. Um, there's plenty of subsets of numbers you could come up with that are not um, that are not infinite. Um, and in fact, there there are others that might be infinite that are very hard uh, to to say this. So uh, a very famous example um, is uh, the twin prime conjecture. So a twin prime or a pair of twin primes uh, are prime numbers that are separated by one number. So for instance, uh, 17 and 19 are twin primes because they have a single number between them. So they're they're both prime. 17 and 19 are prime numbers, um, and they're separated by you know, well, their difference is two, which means there's a single number between them, right? Um, uh, you know, so uh, 29 and 31, right, are, are other examples of twin primes. So the question is, are there infinitely many twin primes? Um, and this is still unknown. Uh, it's unknown. So it's not as easy as saying, oh, well, there's infinitely many numbers. So, you know, clearly, there's infinitely many primes and twin primes. It's, you have to actually... You know, show this. So, how do you show that there's infinitely many prime numbers? So, the very, very classic proof of this fact is by contradiction. So, what does that mean? So, to prove something by contradiction, you assume that it's true, right? Or, sorry, you. Well, okay. So, so um, uh, I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to confuse you here. Um, to prove something by contradiction, you assume that it's false, and then see what would be true uh, assuming that this thing was false and you'd want to derive a contradiction so that oh well you know the only thing that could possibly be true is that my original assumption was wrong but my original assumption was that it was false hmm it's a little bit confusing when I say it out in words like that right and the idea is uh, suppose not well, if there's not infinitely many prime numbers, what does that mean? It means there's finitely many, right? I.e., suppose that the list P1, P2, up to P sub n is an exhaustive list of every prime number. Okay, so this is a list. It's a finite list. There's only n of these things, uh, but it is a list of every prime number. Okay, so we're assuming if there's not infinitely many prime numbers, then there's finitely many prime numbers. If there's finitely many prime numbers, I can list them all, right? Maybe there's like 500 million of them, but still, I could list them all if I was patient enough, right? Okay, so let's say I've listed them all here. Here's every single prime number, okay? So consider the number I'm going to call big N. And this number is the number I get when I multiply every prime number in existence together. So I take every single prime that's in this list and I multiply all of them together and add one okay that's the thing I can do right I, it's just this is just some product of in numbers right so I just take a list of numbers I multiply them all together and I add one okay so um, what uh, what does this do for me? Okay. Well, I want to use the lemma, right, that we just proved. How do I want to use it? So, note 
n is not divisible by any prime on that list. Why? Why can't I say that? When I divide n by any of those primes, what remainder do I get? When I divide big N by P1 or P2 or P3 and so on, I get remainder 1. Right? Okay. Hmm. But by the lemma, that is the thing that we just proved before. We know that big N must have some prime factor. Okay. Because the limit says that every number bigger than one has some prime factor. But we just said that it's not divisible by any prime that's on the list. Okay. Well, this has some prime factor, say Q, but Q is not on the list. Why do we know Q is not on the list? Because we just said that nothing, no prime on the list divides in. Okay. So any prime divisor of N can't be on the list. But why is that a problem? I said that this was an exhaustive list of every prime number. But I just found a prime number that's not on the list. This is a contradiction, right? What is a contradiction, right, logically? The idea here is a contradiction would be a statement that is simultaneously true and false. Right, this is bad. Okay, this is not something that we will tolerate. Right, a statement cannot be both true and false. So it's got to be one or the other. Right, so if a statement is both true or false, there must be some mistake in the logic. There must be an assumption that was made that was not true. The problem, of course, is that everything we did here is perfectly fine logically. So then where was the error? The error was in the very first step. Suppose not, right? This is the only thing we've done where we have actually made a choice. Everything that followed here was logically valid. So the only thing where we threw caution to the wind and did something that, you know, was on us was here. And so this must be false. This must be wrong. But if that's wrong, it means there's infinitely many primes, okay? So when you see a proof by contradiction, a lot of times you'll see this symbol indicating a contradiction. It's not 100% standard, so however you want to do this. The idea is that thus, there are infinitely many primes. And that's how this was shown. Now the original statement of this theorem is that whenever you have a list uh, of, of primes, you have a finite list of primes, there's some prime that's not on the list. Okay, that's another way of stating this. Okay. Now, as I mentioned before, what was, uh, what is kind of the, the, uh, most important overall understanding of primes, right? Uh, the importance of primes
is their role as the building block or the building blocks of every positive integer. What does this mean? So there is what's called the unique factorization theorem. Now I'm not going to uh, state this too formally right now because we'll talk about this later. First thing I'll say is that Euclid formed uh, he Euclid proved a, a version of this um, in Euclid's Elements, but it wasn't actually until like the 1800s that a full proof uh, of this fact was written out. Um, that's not really because they didn't have the machinery to do it. It's mostly because uh, most mathematicians past that kind of viewed this as such an obvious thing that it didn't need to be proved. But technically, this wasn't proven, uh, like I said, until like the 1800s. But um, anyway, what's the unique factorization theorem say? So the unique factorization theorem uh, says that um, any uh, positive integer... So n bigger than 1 can be uniquely expressed as a product of primes. And so literally, the primes are the things that build up every other number, right? And I mean, another, a number is either prime or composite, um, and that gets you all the numbers, okay? And you can... Uh, decompose a number into its prime factorization is kind of one of the best ways to study its properties. Okay. Um, so uh, we'll mention this again a bit later. Like I said, Euclid actually formed, uh, proved a form of this um, in, in the elements. Uh, let's mention someone else quickly. Uh, so we'll mention Eratosthenes. This will not be the first... Uh, Time we mention Eratosthenes. Yeah, that's right. Um, uh, so uh, Eratosthenes uh, is um, it will not be the last time we mention uh, his name. Uh, a really impressive guy. Uh, but one of the things that uh, he did. So Eratosthenes was uh, it's about 230 BC. So he was writing about a um, hundred years after Euclid. Uh, he was responsible for something called the sieve of Eratosthenes. He was also famous, uh, you might have heard of him, from uh, he computed the circumference of the Earth uh, to really, really high degree of ac or accuracy. Um, he uh, also approximated the uh, angular tilt of the Earth on its axis. Um, uh, the process by which he did those things is actually pretty amazing too. And I'll discuss those stories when we talk about Greek mathematics later. Um, but anyway, the sieve of Eratosthenes is, is a very, very simple uh, way of kind of figuring out uh, the prime numbers uh, uh, or which, which numbers are prime. So you start at, you know that one's not prime, so you start at two, okay? And you list numbers, so I'm just going to write a bunch of numbers here, seven, 8, 9, 10, uh, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. Yep, just keep going. Okay. So I'm going to, let's see, I'll stop at like, uh, where do I want to stop? Let's stop at like 40 something. Yeah, we'll stop here. Okay, so how does this work? So the idea is you start here at 2. 2 is prime. We circle 2. And then we cross off every multiple of 2 Okay, on the list. So, of course, a multiple of 2, that's the even numbers, right? So uh, we cross all of those out. The reason we're crossing those out is because we know that those cannot possibly be prime because they're multiples of 2, right? So they are certainly not prime. They have a factor that we know very well, 
Okay, so that gets rid of all of those. Now, once we've done that, we come to the next number and it is guaranteed to be prime. Why? Because the idea is that we've crossed out everything to the left of it that could have been uh, a divisor. And if we didn't cross it out, then there's nothing else left. And so nothing else could be a proper divisor of this number. And so this is prime. So then we cross out multiples of that number. So six, we've already crossed out nine. Ah, that's something that we get with three, but that we didn't get with two. Okay. So nine, 12, 15. Yep. Um, so next, uh, 18's already been crossed out. 21, yep. All right, 24, 27. All right, 30, 33. 36, 39. All right, um, uh, so 39, uh, for, so 42, 45 gets crossed out as well. Okay, so now again, we follow this. So four is crossed out, so it's not prime. Five is prime because there's nothing else that's a candidate that could divide five. Okay, same deal. Then we make sure that we've crossed out every multiple of five. So uh, we've already crossed out 10. We've already crossed out 15. We've already crossed out 20. 25 gets crossed out here, right? 30 we've already crossed out. 35 gets crossed out. 40, 45 has already been crossed out, okay. And so we follow this process. Ah, seven must be prime and so on. And by the by the time you cross all of these out, what is left will be exactly the prime numbers. Okay, so uh, I think we've got everything here. Right? I think we've think we've got it all. Yeah. Yep. Those are there's all my primes less than uh, less than 46. Right. Okay. All right. And so um, this is the uh, this is the idea behind the Civ Veritasis. Now this is not a very high powered. <laughs> Uh, method obviously uh, but it, this is a this is a basic method uh, for for coming up with these uh, these primes um, okay so anyway I'm I'm out of time for today I'm gonna mention a couple more things about primes and then we'll kind of get back to uh, we'll get back on track so uh, it's a detour because we're we're out of the you know chronology that we had begun where we've now gone from Egyptian math to uh, Greek math, which is a jump of a jump of you know more than a thousand years. So we will we will be going back to the era of the Egyptian mathematicians um, next time when I talk about Sumerian and Babylonian mathematicians. Um, but it, it's impossible kind of to 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 go on without mentioning something about the prime numbers uh, first. So anyway, um, so I, like I said, I'll say a couple more things about prime numbers. Um, next time and then we'll continue on with Sumerian math so anyway I will see you all on Friday um by Friday afternoon I'll post your first um your first homework which will be a pretty short uh pretty short assignment I'll give you a couple of questions I want you to to consider so anyway so I'll post that and let you all know like Friday afternoon maybe before class or maybe right after but anyway, I will see you all on Friday.